Welcome back to episode four of We Are TPM. My name is John Teixeira. I'm here with Kyle Teixeira. And our topic today is going to be acquiring your first rental property. You ready for this, Kyle? Always. Let's get it. We have Trevor Kerr with Gateway Mortgage sitting in with us. Thanks for coming. How are you guys? Great. So we have Trevor sitting in on our topic today because, Trevor, I feel like you could really add a lot of value to our topic. And, um, and the easiest way, Trevor, you and I help people do this all the time. And the easiest way to acquire your first rental property is, is really kind of simple. It's how most people do it, don't they? And that is they just moving up, yeah, moving up just... into another home. Buying, buying, buying your first home, you know, with low down payments, great interest rates as primary residence and, and stuff, and then moving up, whether that be a year, two, five years later, and hanging on to that property as a rental property and moving on to upgrading to the next home is, is the best and the easiest way to do it. I want to expand on that a little bit, but Kyle, you did this, didn't you? Yeah, I actually just did this recently. You know, you upgrade the home you live in go pick what you what you want next and when you leave the other one behind you don't sell it and you turn it into a rental yeah that's 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 the best way to acquire these rental properties and have the best interest rates with lowest down payments because if you're buying a, you know your primary residence you know and upgrading from there you can do as little as you know a three percent down payment or you know if you are a veteran or you know uh, a rural in rural area for rural development you can do a hundred percent financing so buying your your property that way and then upgrading in the future a year two years three years down the road is the best way to do it because not only are you having a low down payment in the best interest rates if you're acquiring rental properties and stuff the traditional way of putting 20 percent down and stuff the interest rates are you know three quarters of a point or so higher so it's still a great way to acquire rental properties if you own a, your you know dream home and want to acquire smaller rental properties but for a first-time person starting out, it's a great way to buy, you know, that smaller home and upgrade every couple years and hang on to those properties as rental properties. Especially with the VA hack, but we'll get into that. Yeah. We'll get into that <laughs> later. Yeah. So, so I just want to kind of summarize that a little bit, Trevor. You. So what you're saying is that I could buy my home and use my VA or an FHA loan, which has no or very little down payment, right, for my primary right. residence. And then when I decide to move on to my next residence, I can do that again and have the same low down payment and the same interest rates? You can on certain criteria, okay? FHA does not allow you to keep buying FHA properties, okay? You can only have one FHA and stuff. But at that point in time, you could refinance that property into a conventional loan and then right. use your FHA again or with VA VA actually allows you to have bonus entitlement okay where you can have two VAs okay once you have two VAs you're not going to be able to do a third and a fourth right. through right. VA but yes you but can there should be no reason to have a third one it's, uh, there's usually no reason to have a second one because usually you've you've gained enough equity in your home to either refinance or get rid of that mortgage insurance, right? That's correct. Refinance into a conventional loan with no PMI at that point in time and that way you're not having to keep putting, you know, 20%, 25% down on investment properties. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong, if it's the if the second one is the one you're going to buy, you can still do the 5% conventional. That's correct. And even refinance the, the the first one into a conventional too and yep get it the best of both worlds that may or may not be what i just did so. <laughs> <laughs> may or may not be i think it is what you just did or what we just did yeah, yeah so definitely. so it's i mean it, buying your first one is the easiest one right oh. um so then from there on i mean we can't we don't want to lead people to believe we can continue doing that to some degree you can continue doing that if you're moving into a different area um, your family's growing, you can still continue to do that and acquire property. I always tell people, you know, what you want to do is acquire as much property in your lifetime as you can and hang on to it, if, if at all possible. It's the best way to build wealth is, you, hang, you know, hanging on to this property and letting, you know, 
letting the tenant, you know, pay down your mortgage and while it's appreciating in uh, property value. So if I don't have, you know, I've already done this or for some reason I don't have the ability to do it this way, we're going to go get a more conventional loan. Like let's say I'm going to stay in my home. I don't have any interest in leaving, but I do want a rental property. Okay. What does that look like? I'm going to get a conventional loan. You had mentioned 20% down. Is that the only way to do that? No, I mean, we have a traditional loan program that will allow you to do as little as 15% down on investment property. Okay. I don't recommend it just because at that point in time, the interest rates are even a little bit higher than putting 20% down. Plus then you have mortgage insurance. So do have, you know, do need to put 20% down, you know, or I recommend putting 20% down, but there's a lot of different ways of going about it as well. You know, you, if you have enough equity in your current home, go get you a home equity line of credit or get you a cash out on your current home to come up with a down payment and stuff to buy that investment property. Well, and I think it's important for our audience to know, because a lot of the things we're going to talk about, pretty much everything we're going to talk about is based around the 80% LTV rule. Mm -hmm. So getting into that a little bit is that you have to have 20% equity remaining in your home by law to not have mortgage insurance. In correct? Texas. Yeah, 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 in Texas. So that's why you have to put that 20% down. Sure. So and getting around that rule or, or you know, making it work is the... And with the the appreciation and the home prices and stuff here, mm -hmm. there's so many people. I mean, if you've owned your home three, four years, even if you put a minimum down payment, you most likely have over 20% equity in your home now. Yeah, and most people don't know they're probably still paying mortgage insurance, yep. right? Yeah, so. and that's another thing that they can reach out to their you know lender. There's a ways to have that mortgage insurance removed, mm -hmm. okay, based on the new value of the home. As long as it's a conventional loan, you know, FHA, you cannot have it removed, you know, like conventional. But there's, that's a good tip for a lot of people that are sitting out there. A lot of people right now are paying mortgage interest. They might have to pay an appraisal, you know, fee to have it removed. But mm -hmm. when you're talking about some of these people are paying $100, $200 a month in, in mortgage interest, uh, I mean, mortgage insurance, if they had their house reappraised and stuff with their lender, they have to go through their lender to do this. But they could potentially get rid of that mortgage um, insurance, which is huge. Yeah, that is huge. And that's one of the ways you were talking about earlier where you could you could just refinance the home you live in that you probably have 20% equity anyway yep. and then go use your FHA again on the, you know, the upgrade correct. house. Yep. So. Yeah, and using those numbers that you talked about, the 80% rule and all that kind of um, – and this is one of the ways we were talking about. So I want to talk about uh, down payment, how we collect down payment. And – and one of those ways is using that equity, right, mm -hmm. through either a refinance, like you suggested, Kyle, or a home equity loan. You can go to some of the bigger banks and some of the local banks and get a home equity loan. Um, I don't think you do those, Trevor, but, yeah. I mean, there's a small number of banks that do them, and you could kind of use that kind of like a credit card, right? And yep. Get your line of credit of, you know, say you have forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 in equity in there. It's a line of credit. You draw on it, you know, whenever you want, so. It's a great Correct way. me if I'm wrong. You can't use funds for a down payment that are based on um, uncollateralized credit, right? That's so because correct. It's like a credit an card asset. and stuff. Yes, yeah. credit card. You can't just take a credit card advance to get your down payment. But a home equity line of credit and stuff is different because it's secured by. Yeah, property. yeah, I get that question a lot. So. So I guess let's kind of start with the different ways to get your down payment. We've gone over a couple of them, but the big, the big, the. the first one I would say is just save for it, right? So especially if you're not going to be moving into that next home, you need that 20% and you know how much money, about how much money you're going to need for a down payment if it's 20% of your median house price or your typical rental property nowadays is probably between two hundred and $250,000. So you need forty dollars to $50,000 in down payment, right? So just start saving for it. Just be intentional and have a game plan to save for it. Um, you should be saving 10% of your income anyways if you if you attribute your, to to the old financial ways that I've I've mentioned uh, uh, richest man in Babylon before that's one of the oldest books I read back in high school pay yourself first right and so if you have an intention about 
buying a rental property than just have an intention about how you're going to get there and how you're going to save for it, right? Yep. It's all about a plan. Because when you're ready to buy it, you need a plan of where you're going to go buy. We talked a lot about pulling equity from another property already. How about borrowing from a family, Trevor? Could could I do that? Could I get some money from maybe an, an uncle that has a lot of money and he doesn't need it all and he wants wants to lend it to me so I could buy my first rental property? No, you can't take out a loan that's uncollateralized from, you know, a family member or something, but you can do a gift, you know, from a family member when you're purchasing a primary residence and stuff. They do not allow gifts and stuff for investment property. So if you're going to get that loan and stuff that hack around it, if you're going to get that loan from a family member, you need to do it at least 60 days before you plan on buying that home. Okay. So get that money in the bank and Uncle Joe, I <laughs> am sure. planning to buy a rental property. I'd love to help you, little Johnny. Here you go and wait 60 90 days before you before you execute on that. That's correct. So have it sitting there what we call seasoned in your bank, right? That is correct. Got it. And when you call someone like Trevor to get pre-qualified, tell him you did that, make sure it's been done right, right? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right. So, Trevor, I don't know how much you know about this, but one of the other hacks that you can do for um, coming up with this down payment is borrowing from your 401k or any other kind of investment um, that you might have. You you can borrow from these, right? Do you that know much correct. about this, Trevor? Yes. that's It's a great way to come up with your down payment, whether it's an investment home or your primary home. At that point in time, you're borrowing from your own money, so you're paying yourself back on it. And it's, you know, a lot of people have 401k set up with their company or or should. And you have that money sitting there that you really can't touch anyway until, you know, you're of age, you know, 62 and a half or whatever. And so at that point in time, you can borrow against that money and you're paying interest back to yourself. So it's a great way to come up with your down payment. And I suggest, you know, a lot of people that even have the money sitting in their checking or savings account that have the money and don't want to deplete that money, it's a great way for them to, you know, borrow from themselves and come up with that down payment. So I actually had a conversation with a friend and asked me about about this method the other day. And it turns out I didn't know this. There's a lot of misleading information on the Internet, of course, about that borrowing from yourself aspect of it yeah. and making it sound like mm-hmm. you're paying interest back and, um, you know, you're taking a loan out. And, and when you dive into it, it, in reality, it just means you can't take a tax deduction until you get that amount of money back in. That there, is correct? correct. Okay. That is correct. Perfect. Yeah, because it was a little misleading the way the internet likes to word things you said tax kyle and i glossed over <laughs> hey Just, when people are looking for reason, reasons not to do something you know sometimes they think they'll find them <laughs> on those 401k loans i mean yes you can do it a couple different ways as long as you're loaning the money and stuff you're not getting hit with a tax on it mm-hmm. if you can have the option to take an early withdrawal from your 401k and just not pay that money back at that point in time you're getting yeah, and that's not what heavily. we're suggesting. We, we no. do not want to do that. <laughs> I don't ever suggest you know people do that. Take out a loan, pay it back. When they're spacing this, these loans out over five to seven years normally on these four hundred one ks, you know, you're not paying. Uh, you're not going to see a huge difference in your paycheck. So I always suggest. Do the loan. Don't take the tax penalties and just pull money out. Yeah, and the contributions already going from your paycheck into it yeah. contribute back to Pre-tax. that, correct? Yeah. 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 So one of the things, I'm, I'm not going to try to play financial advisor because I'm definitely not a licensed financial advisor. I am a licensed real estate agent, but but just using some common sense, right, on what a 401k is. I know that these financial advisors, they talk about diversification all the time, right? Like mm-hmm. they want you to diversify your portfolio and be in all these different funds to to spread out your risk, right? And depending on your age, you might be more risky or less risky depending on how close you are to retirement. Well, this should be, in my view, this should be looked at exactly the same way as as part of your diversification process. And when you look at the the value that you get through the equity and the and the and the increased value that you get in the home that you're going to buy compared to what you might get in your typical mutual fund 
which truthfully is where most people's 401k yeah. is, right? Mm-hmm. They just pick one of the four mutual funds that their company offers them and and then they never think about it again and every single week it just goes into there and and people aren't extremely active about about where they're what's happening to their investment money. They kind of let their their company yeah. you know drive that bus. So when you look at what that investment property can do for you compared to the money that's going into that that mutual fund, it's it's a huge difference. I think it's the best investment you can have. When you start looking at, you know, say people are maxing out their 401ks, and I believe it's 19,000, 19,5 or so this year. Okay, it changes a little bit every year. And you look at, okay, I maxed out my 401k and had put in 19,5. And then, of course, most employers, you know, match a little percentage on there. But just to give a rule of thumb, say you put in 19,000 in your 401k and your employer probably contributed about 4,000 or so. So now you have 23,000. And depending on what that market does and stuff, yeah, you, you might have 30,000 in there that year. But if you looked at doing the same thing with rental property and acquiring more houses and stuff, say you did that same thing and, and bought a rental property with that 23,000, okay, or the 19,000 that you've put in and kept that and the appreciation that you're going to see on your money and allowing making money, you know, off of somebody else's money is basically what it is because right. at that point in time you're you acquire that rental property and say you're renting that place out for 1500 a month and your mortgage payments, you know, 1100 a month or 1200 a month. So you're gaining a little bit of monthly income, monthly cash flow from there, but the biggest part of that is that tenant is paying your mortgage down while that property is appreciating in value. So you're getting it basically, you know, tenfold is what I say. I mean, if if you look at back at my personal experience, you know, owning rental properties, which of course you manage for me, John, a perfect example, the, the one in Mansfield that I've owned, I believe for eight years now, um, bought that property for $125,000 right now today i think we hadn't looked at it here lately but i think it's worth around 220 230 um and my tenant's been paying that mortgage i'm not paying any extra on it and now i owe 40,000 on that mortgage right. okay mm-hmm. i did do a 15 year mortgage you know some investors do different you know terms on there i'm using it to pay that mortgage off you know but so if you look at it right now I've gained $180,000, you know, in, how many in equity in that home in about seven to eight years. I don't know exactly what it is. If you looked at having your money in the stock market or something, the the initial investment that I put in there, a little over $20,000. Now that 20000 that I've put in, while they've been paying my mortgage, I haven't been paying any extra out of my pocket, I now have 180000 you will not find any investment out there that you can turn twenty thousand dollars into a hundred and eighty thousand yeah. dollars in this a matter of seven quickly. eight years. Yep. Especially yep. calling it a low risk investment yeah. too. So, yeah, I mean, and Kyle, you know, you hear a lot about um, compound interest, right? And that's huge right now. Everybody's talking about. I mean, people have always been talking about compound interest, but right now it seems like. It seems like a, a popular topic, right? <laughs> and and while compound interest is a great thing, and these products that that people are building around compound interest are absolutely phenomenal, they can't they can't touch what you just described. No, no. I I wish I could find something better, but I just <laughs> there's nothing that well, I found that that there's mm. there's only one thing better: a great profitable business. Well. And I always say this: the only the only two great ways to build wealth on the planet is is through a really great profitable business that you can scale, and and real estate. And by that argument, most if not all profitable big businesses own real estate. That's right. Yep. For the same reasons. And almost all wealthy people have a business, and and they have real estate. So. Um, Anyway, so uh, kind of going through our list, I guess the only other thing that, that we haven't talked about, which 
I don't hesitate to get into it. I just, uh, we don't have a lot of details on it, but well, partnerships and crowdfunding. Kyle, you like to talk about crowdfunding a little bit. To, what, what is crowdfunding? I mean, crowdfunding is exactly what it sounds like, really. It's, it's getting a crowd of people and collecting funds into one fund for a purpose. Um, you, know, you could call it a lot of different things, but it's, it's syndication. You, know, you call it a syndicate in a technical way because you syndicate all these resources, whether it's operational or monetary, and to attack the purpose. And in most of these crowdfunding purposes, it's crowdfunding some money, and sometimes one of the you know one guy may, maybe is not putting in all the money, but he's doing all the work. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. It all comes down to operation agreements. But at the end of the day, as Trevor can tell you, you have 20 percent. You can buy it under any entity or, or partnership and stuff like that. So. And yeah, and we we could talk a little bit more about this later, Trevor, because we're going to talk about your your experience as as a landlord in in a minute here. But but partnerships can be look a lot of different ways, and I'm not always a huge fan of people doing partnerships. But if done the right way with the right people, right, that can be a way to get you into that first rental property, which is what we're what we're talking about. Well, and it just allow you to be able to acquire, you know, much more real estate a, a lot faster, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. doing that. So, yeah. It's like when we talk to the Setons, it's not just compound interest, it's compound, you know, availability of funds, of resources to acquire more property and, and flip all that together to build a rental portfolio. So, that's the end goal, right? Yeah, absolutely. So let's knock out a couple more of these really quick, and then we'll get into to acquiring your, your property. So a couple other ways that aren't really well used right now because of the market, but owner financing. Mm-hmm. Um, I've acquired some properties and had some people acquire properties through owner financing. I don't want to say it's a thing of the past. I think it's probably in a different market, something that will come back and be used again. But it's not being widely used right now because the market is the way it is. It's just so hot that, you know, there's no reason for people to be doing owner financing right now. Well, I'd argue that and interest rates as well. Yeah, yeah. interest rates are so low. It's not it's not making it profitable for people to own or finance. Yeah, the the only ones that are doing you know owner finances you know of course if running across a buyer that cannot obtain a loan due to credit or income or something that that's their only resort they want to own a home and you know a seller is willing to take that risk you know with a lot higher interest rate of course you know but like you said you're, we're not seeing it hardly anymore you know when we were doing these or helping people do them or you know being involved in any kind of owner finance deal they were usually in the 8 to 10% range yeah. but that was previous to 2012 i don't think i even even sniffed an owner finance deal since then i haven't seen one in a while yeah <laughs> yeah not anything big so and then so the other way i want to talk about a little bit and we and uh, private money and hard money um kind of two different things but i've lumped them together for the purposes of this discussion because basically they're they're more convent your trevor you do a more conventional way of lending the the kind that most people do right Mm -hmm. but there's a whole industry of lenders out there that are doing things that are what we call asset based so they're based on the asset that you're buying so they do things a little bit differently they allow you to get in a little easier at a higher cost and they're meant to be shorter term so they're meant to be use this to get into the home right at a higher cost, right, to get into it, and then as quickly as you can refinance out of it into a more conventional loan like you would provide, right, Trevor? That's correct. Yeah, and there's, I mean, that's, you call it creative financing sometimes because it can be an avenue to, you know, get that 80% mark. Maybe you can get hard money um, or private money like, like you called it and use that to acquire the property, fix it up, and then now you are able to get a conventional loan and still be below the now um, the market value of that property assumingly has increased with your work and now 80 percent of that market value is 
closer to what you owe. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, using these, you know, hard money, private money lenders and stuff, yes, you are going to pay higher interest rate, higher closing fees and stuff, but it you might be able to obtain that property with a 5% down payment or something at that point in time, you know, which... Or no down payment. Or, or no down payment, you know, depending on, you know, the asset that you're buying. So at that point in time... You, you know, it, you are going to pay a little bit higher, you know, fees and, and interest rate at the beginning. But if we, you don't have that 20% to put down on that property to buy it a conventional way, it allows you to obtain that property right now, refinance it later, and, you know, for a lot less money out of pocket. So and There's always a way to combine financing. So. Yep. All right. So let's get into, let, let's get into choosing your property. So, Really, I, I want to talk about four different types of properties, and and there's single family, there's multifamily, and then there's a the, well multifamily. The the multifamily I'm talking about is really that two to four unit multifamily, right? And then there's like small apartment complexes, which are you know five units and up, or commercial properties. So all of them are different investment models that you can use all of them different types of properties that get you a different risk reward so i have kind of this mantra that i tell people since we're talking to that person going out and thinking about their first rental property it's really single family you know Mm -hmm. more than anything because that person that's buying their first rental property usually they're they're doing one of the things that we've talked about here. They're, they don't have a ton of money, right? It's not what we would call disposable income. So what I want for my first time investors is to have the most liquid product that they can. That means I can get my money out of that as quickly as I need to, if something were to happen in my life, right, Trevor? I mean, how many people have you seen Trevor that have just unexpectedly lost a job in the middle of a deal or, 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 you know, shortly after buying a home and they have to scramble to do something different. Yeah, turn. I mean, it happens all the time. You know, life always can throw curveballs at you. You know, a single family or even the two to four unit stuff is is something that you can turn around and, you know, sell a year down the road, six months down the road if you needed to and, and get that, you know, money back out of it. So it, it's it's probably the one of the least risky, you know, of those products as you were talking about the small apartment complexes and stuff, you're not going to be able to turn that around as quickly. Not to say that you can't, you know, turn it around as quickly. It's just single family or two to four units and stuff is, is going to be a lot easier to, you know, get a deal done and, and move quickly if you need to. It's sustained demand. It's just like in, you know, you're starting out risk management and you, there's always a sustained demand for a mm-hmm. single family. And, That's, and, that's great. That's 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 perfect. That is that sustained demand. That was a really good term, Kyle. Thank thank well, you for sharing I get the that one with us. About like buying your first one being a commercial office <laughs> building or something, and you know, right. not saying that any right. location won't always have a demand for that, but it's not a sustained and efficient demand, I should say. Sometimes sure. even the, a hot spot building will take, you know, could take a week, could take six months to rent out. That's not the risk management uh, factor that a uh, new investor really wants well that's what i was thinking about when i was listening to you trevor talk about like um you know small apartment buildings and how long it takes and 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 then and then you threw in sustained demand kyle that's perfect segue to to what i was thinking and that is when you talk to people right now that are paying attention maybe even in the past five years they're seeing these apartment buildings fly off the market Mm -hmm. and thinking that what you just said is crazy right even the duplexes I I can't get a duplex in Arlington to save my life right now. (laughs) Like as soon as they come on the market, they're selling for more than they've ever been worth ever. Right. But that is not normal, is it? But it's not a normal, you know, deal. Single family is a normal deal. You're always going to be able to, you know, everyone always needs to. (laughs) <laughs> have some place to live, don't they? Yeah. The apartment complexes, and yes, right now, people are sitting here listening, man, I'd love to have an apartment complex right now. I, you know, I can't get one. Right. As soon as they come on the market, they're gone. And yes, that is true to the time period that we're going through right now. But over history and stuff, you know, it's it, 
it's not the same as a single family home. And this is the reason why I say if you're a first time investor and you're not using money that you don't need to live out the rest of your life, buy single family. Because at any point you tell me, John, I need to sell that house. I can sell that house at any market. You know, in 30 to 60 days, I can have that thing sold and closed. I can't say that for all those other products, for the duplex, for the small apartment building or the commercial building. Look what COVID has done to commercial real estate. Yeah. Well, a a lot of... Didn't expect that, did we? the, The commercial real estate, a lot of these businesses have realized, hey, we don't need this commercial space anymore. We've sent everybody home and they're working from home now. So I think there's going to be a big change in that retail, you know, market here coming soon. Well, and taking it back to home equity loans and, and, you know, having that avenue, I know you can't do that on your investment property, but if you do the upgrade process we talked about, you you still have that ability in single family, right? You can, you can actually do, I mean, not the home equity line, you know, but you can do a cash out and stuff on investment properties and stuff. The rules and regulations are a little bit different. Instead of 80%, you're at 75%, mm-hmm. but um, it's, it, it, it's a good avenue for someone, an, an experienced investor that has multiple rental properties, you know, that they've owned 10, 12 years and stuff, own a lot. They can go do cash outs on all of their investment properties to obtain enough funds to go buy another five, six, ten properties. So, yeah, that never happens, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it happens as as often as you can can possibly make it happen. Make it happen. Yeah, That's right. exactly. That's how they do it. All right, so so we've settled on. I mean, obviously, we are all of the same opinion in this room that if you're buying your first investment property, a single family residence, meaning a three two two or somewhere about that, is a good investment for for your first property. Um, so, well, b- well, before you get past the duplex, this is a more rare instance, but I have seen investors where they combine the investment property and first property if you can residence. acquire a fourplex or a duplex and you buy as your you know your initial home you live in one part of it and you rent out the other part of it so it's a that, great that's a great tactic for like a young family maybe that doesn't have children yet right and and this is your first home or even a single a single person that's a, it's a great great way to get if in you can find a i mean not like you're going to in this market but if you can find a whole fourplex and you know you're in a a fourth of it, you're pretty much getting that. Your the home you live in paid for by that's your a rents. great point because a lot of people don't know that you can go out there and buy a duplex or a fourplex as your primary home, have the low down payments and stuff. And then all of a sudden you have mm-hmm. one one to three rental properties right there to acquire. Mm-hmm. So and to specify that you can you can get that loan for the entire fourplex. That is correct. Yeah. So which is. Another creative way of doing it. I love it. Some good gold out of the middle of this conversation. <laughs> I, I don't think I even knew that. That's awesome. Love it. Well, I know the answer to this, Trevor, but just to clarify for our audience, that maxes out at four. If Once you get it over is. a five. Yeah. It, one, one to four family. Mm-hmm. After you get over, you know, five units and stuff, then you're switching over to a commercial loan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can and that's obtain. in Texas. I assume that's. I, I believe that's everywhere. Mm-hmm. But. All right, well, let's get back to our first rental property. Let's get back to acquiring our first one. So, you know, now we've decided, let's say we've decided that we're going to get a single family residence, right? We're going to go buy a home somewhere near us or um, we just need to make offers. And I'm not going to talk about our current market, but in, in any market, you really just want to hire a great professional that understands your goals and objectives to help you through that process, to make some great offers for you and help you acquire that first property, right? And then, Trevor, you're in the business. There's there's a lot of people out there doing this, right? There's a lot of people helping others to try to buy their rental properties. They're not all they're not all good. They don't all have that that buyer's yeah, goals it, and objectives in mind. It's not the same, you know. It, obviously, there's a ton of great real estate agents out there, okay? And they can help you buy a home and do everything. When you're talking about investment properties, you really need to have a real estate 
professional that is keyed in to the rental markets and stuff too because that's huge you know any realtor can go out there and help you buy that home and do a great job but they might not be in tune um, as what the rental market's going on and to help advise you to buy the best what's it going to be like to manage that property as a rental property after you buy it well, that's kind of what you mean, right? Yeah. Uh, what you can expect, what market rents and stuff, right. you know, are going on. So my personal, you know, deal, when I first bought the, my first rental property and stuff, John, as you know, I managed it myself for, I think, about a year, okay? And it was horrible. I don't I don't like managing, you know, my own property. That's why you manage it. And now I just kind of sit it and forget about it, you mm-hmm. know? which takes a lot off my plate, you know. I don't have to worry about, hey, I'm out of town and my garbage disposal, you know, goes out and the renter's calling me to come fix it or something or having me try to line up a contractor to go out there and, you know, do that. You handle all that stuff for me. I don't even have, I I don't even know that you do it most of the time, you Mm -hmm. know. So it's the ease of that, but also you end up making you you make more money after me paying the fees than I was making before because you're getting better, you know, rent than I was getting at that point in time. And at, at that point in time as well, you're, if my tenant leaves, you're, you're so in tune into the rental property market and stuff and have people looking all the time that most of the time you have that thing rented out within, you know, a couple of days or a week, you know, for me doing it myself, a lot of times I would go 30, 45 days before I had a new tenant in there. So a lot of people that are thinking, man, I don't want to pay a property manager to manage my properties. I promise you this, you'll end up making at least about the same amount of money over the course of the time with zero headache at that point in time. You might even make more money even though you're paying a property manager fees. So i I mean, unless that's what you do for a living, I would highly recommend any time you own rental properties is hire a good rental property manager. Well, I definitely agree with you. Um, but since do you, you. Since, yeah. <laughs> you do. That's surprising. Since you, since you brought it up, uh, I want to ask you about the fear of renewal too, because um, I've asked some other landlords about that, but not renewing your tenant because you, you know them personally. And at the end of the day, that a lot of the times is what brings, that's, that's an, the tool we use to bring up to market rent, not maliciously or anything, but sure. when it needs to happen. No, I, mean, I I totally agree, uh, you know, with that. You know, if if you're managing your own properties, you do start to build a relationship a little bit with your, you know, tenant. And a lot of times, yes, they don't want to make them mad and don't raise their rent, even though that's what it should be. That's current market rents. That's why they call it current market rents and why you go up. Mm -hmm. But too many people get into, you know, managing their own properties and, hey, they've been great tenants and stuff. We haven't raised their rent for the last eight years. Well, you start looking at that eight years and whether it's $50, you know, difference in rent a year or a hundred, I mean, look how much money you just wasted by being too scared to raise their rent, you know, so. Because the mortgage doesn't change at all, right? I hope it does taxes. Oh, he finally yeah. said it. He's taxes the... and insurance, yes. <laughs> so even though even though you have a fixed rate mortgage on, on that property, you're I mean, if your property's appreciating, which it has, you know, almost every single year forever here in Texas, okay, that means your mortgage payment or your out of pocket for that property is going up every year as well because taxes always go up. Insurance pretty much always goes up because cost of rebuild and stuff. So insurance is going up. So if you're not raising the rent, okay, to current market rents, you're slowly diminishing your profits every single year. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Your own value. So. so I talk about one of the biggest reasons why a property manager helps is because they don't make fear-based decisions, right? The, the owners make fear-based decisions and we, as your property manager, we make business decisions for you, right? What's the best business decision? I love how you laid out the marketing machine is what I was thinking of, right? So the single investor that has one or two or three properties, every time they have a new tenant that they need a new vacancy, it's like they have to start this marketing machine over with that they either... 
they have some experience with or they don't have experience with. It doesn't really matter. It's like starting that snowball, right? Yep. And where for us, that machine is constantly going. Like oh, yeah. I got an applicant on one of your homes and I accept an app, the best application for yours. And I may have three or four more that are really good applicants that I can take to one of your other properties or to somebody else's property. Right. So that machine is just constantly going instead of having to restart it again. Yeah. No, let's say I love it. Trevor, we've talked about what, well, through our topic here, we've talked about your experience here. So we're going to change this up and I'd love to finish our topic just a little bit and then get back into your, your total experience and, and, and with renting. Cause we've already talked a lot about that. Uh, I've chosen a home. I've made an offer, gone through the process of getting a loan. Maybe it's with you or however we're acquiring that property and we're closing on the property. Now we need to choose we don't need to figure out how we're going to manage it, how we're going to market it and manage it. One of the things that people don't realize when I help my clients buy a home, I also help negotiate that process of marketing that home for a new tenant while we're under contract. There's been so many times, Kyle, that we've closed somebody and had a tenant ready to go in it immediately I've even done it where they've gone in beforehand and we've negotiated it with the previous seller. And so that you've just bought a property with a new tenant almost immediately with no vacancy. Yeah. And call it a benefit of, you know, having a great manager also be your real estate agent, but it's also one of those things you can, you can only do that with it being the same, the same broker Mm because, you know, exclusivity and all that. So it, yeah, it's, it's worked out very well for our clients when we when we get that done for them because a month of lost rent and two months of lost rent whatever's going on that that makes a difference on your bottom line and oh, from, yeah. from your cash flow bottom line that could that could be a year or so to recover in in a 30 to 60 day difference and i, I guess the point of this part of of our topic here is just really find a really great pro right trevor you 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 articulated really well all the reasons why you want to find somebody but find a great pro i'd like to think it's me i'd like to think i'm i'm the best right and that you would choose me but but there are some other people out there that can do it really well and and you may not be in my area just choose a great pro that can manage this property for you and then you know from there you're just collecting rent watching your value go up, watching your equity go up. Trevor, you talked about it. We'll share in a future podcast. We're going to share our, our equity graph that I like to, to draw for people, right? Mm-hmm. Trevor, Kyle, you, you watch me draw this for clients. When I sit down with them for the first time, I draw that equity graph that, that Trevor had articulated for us about, you know, while the principle of your loan is going down and your value is going up, you're creating this bell curve of equity in between that is basically the wealth that we're talking about creating when we when we're when we're here every week, right? Our building wealth with real estate chart. Maybe I'll have Steve show the show the actual visual I made years <laughs> ago that you refused to use in like drawing instead. So <laughs> <laughs> one thing and I don't know if we're gonna cover it, but one thing I want to touch on too that a lot of people that are first time investors that have never really thought about a lot of people have it in their head that you know I just don't make enough money to afford my current house payment in an investment property you know I hear these debt to income ratios and stuff and I did the math in my head and stuff and I I just don't make enough money to be able to buy an investment property what a lot of people don't realize is when you're buying an investment property the lender will take a look at your um, your your market rents okay when they do an appraiser an appraiser goes out and stuff and they say the market rents for this property you're buying is two thousand dollars a month okay they take a calculation of 75 percent of that value okay so at that point in time yes your market rents are two thousand they're only going to give you credit for fifteen hundred okay on that property but your mortgage payment's going to be usually at that 75% or less anyway. <clears throat> so in reality, buying that investment property actually helps your debt to income ratios not hurt it, okay? Because we offset it with what you should be able to rent that property out for. We'll give you credit for that. So 
you can, you know, a lot of people that are thinking, I just don't make enough money to be able to do that and qualify. Yes, you do. Okay. <laughs> if you make enough money to qualify for your current home and your other bills that you, then you have, then yes, you will qualify for an investment property. It's a great point. Trevor. It is. And to touch one of the points you just hit there was if you, you know, when you go to buy your second, for example, now, you know, you're, the first one isn't even really being considered in your DTI, but the additional cash flow on top of it does help reduce your DTI on this, does. the second consideration. Yep. So another thing that snowballs down. So. I love it. So let's simplify that. Can I simplify that sure. in, in some simple math now? So that $2,000, let's say, let's say for some reason I put a bunch of money down and my interest, my loan, taxes, insurance, and everything is $1,000 out of pocket on a house. And I'm going to go buy another house. Oop. I'm going to go buy another house. And when I buy that house, I now have $1,000 of additional income on top of whatever I'm getting from my job or my business to put toward my what you're calling debt to income ratio to qualify for that next house. Is that, that is, correct? That's exactly correct. Love it. So thanks, Trevor. That's two pieces of gold in this podcast. Can we, can we get, get a third one? You're going to limit no? us to two? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle's probably got a third one he can spit out for us real quick. So, Trevor, let's talk about let's wrap this up. We we've, we've this has been a great topic and I hope people are are seeing how easy it is, you know, to to get your first rental property and it really just gets easier from there, doesn't it? It does. Um let's talk about your experience. You shared with us your first property in in Mansfield. How many do you own? Well, total of two solely and then two and a third right two and a third i guess <laughs> if you have have a condo um uh, that of course we partnered uh with you and one of our other friends in orange beach alabama so two and a third right now and you know i just looking at it, acquiring more and more. I wish I would have started this 20 years ago, but um, fortunately, I was a little bit late to the game on on getting into it. You so, know. Trevor, you're kind of like me. You are you are an extremely high producing loan officer. You have a lot of clients that you're helping every single month. You have real estate agents that are bringing you their business. So. You have this great problem, and that problem keeps you from being able to invest probably as much as you would like to. And that is, it's kind of yeah. like the old adage of the the uh, the mechanic's car is usually the worst, you know, car yeah, in the taking in the, care of everybody else's yeah. stuff <laughs> exactly. and don't have time to do your own. <laughs> exactly, I've 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 had that similar problem early in my career. I've kind of made it a point, you know, over the past few years to to not. To force myself to not fall into that trap, and I know that you have too. Yeah. You recently you bought one. I don't know, I'll say a year or so ago, you bought your second one here in Dallas Fort Worth area, mm -hmm. right? In in Grand Prairie, am I right? Yep. And that one's gone well for you as well. That one's. I I don't even know the address of that home, but <laughs> you know I just I just uh, take I my that. paycheck every. I single can tell day. you it's on Bent Tree. <laughs> well. Can, 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 can I say yeah. that in a podcast? Yeah. It's Is on that okay? Mid yep. <laughs> I don't know if you can say it, but you said it. So. <laughs> you said it. I, I just wanted to demonstrate that I know the address of your property is, is really what I was getting at. Um, yeah, so that one's gone pretty well. You did great acquiring that one, right? Mm -hmm. Even in the midst of, of all of our craziness right now and, and, and finding somebody to renovate that for you really quick. And we got somebody in there really quick. So that, that was, that's been a good property for you. So anyway, so Trevor, so so you've got the two rental properties they are going well. You just see the money coming into your account every month, right? And and sounds like you're really happy with the way that's going. Yeah, it's, um, it, that's one of my favorite things to look at, you know, the money coming into my account and then looking at my mortgage uh, statement and seeing that the the balance go down each month. And then usually I, I don't look at this monthly, but I like to – kind of touch base with you on a yearly basis to find out what my rental property is worth if I chose to, you right. know, to sell it. Right. And when you see your balance going down, you know, each month and the Everybody property value going up. going up each year and the money coming in your bank account, I mean, how... What's what's better than that? It's a no brainer, isn't it? <laughs> it's a no brainer. Cue so, building wealth with real estate chart. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cue the cue the chart that we made years ago. <laughs> Love it. Um, 
so okay so we now and we you mentioned this we we partnered on 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 something we talked about at length what was this two episodes ago kyle three episodes ago our first episode was about short-term rentals of vacation oh, yeah. properties and so trevor you were all in when i when i came to you and and said hey let's do this you and i have been talking for years about doing a uh, short-term rental and we considered doing one around here you know mm-hmm. in dallas fort worth and we've got some but this opportunity came up to do one in Orange Beach and you were all in on doing that with me. And we brought in a third partner and we did that together. And that's been a real blessing. I mean, I know that we've had some challenges with Hurricane Sally with it. And, and, but overall, especially if you look into the future, what an amazing investment that that has been. I, you know, like I said, we had a little hiccup with Hurricane Sally, but luckily insurance and loss of rent and stuff <laughs> has, you know, made that actually in a, into a real, you know, good investment, I think. And we're just going to, we're just now starting to see the fruits of our labor and stuff, yep. which I'm really excited about seeing what, you know, our first full year is actually going to do. And I think it's going to be amazing. And I'd I'd like to go out and buy three, four, or five more of those, you yep. know. So I think that's a, a great way to do it. You know. Sounds like you guys did a little bit of crowdfunding, right? Yep. That's, <laughs> that was a that, form that, of crowdfunding, a, wasn't it? Was a crowd, or, for, form form of crowdfunding. Crowd it was a, more of a partnership. We really created a really formal partnership, didn't we, with, with, with guidelines, written guidelines, and, and everything. So we, I think as partnerships go, we really did that the right way. The partnerships that really scare me is when people kind of do a verbal handshake. They're doing it with, you know, you yeah. and I are friends, right? But you, we all know that... You know, anything can change that in, in, in life. Sometimes things get in the way. And and so the last thing you want is a partnership that goes bad, right? Because somebody else is butthurt. And so when it comes um, to well, and, it, it, and if it's not written up in writing, yeah. you know, at least at that point in time, you know, you can you have exit strategies exactly. and stuff already pre-written. If you're exactly. just doing a handshake and, hey, you buy this with, you know, one, two, three, four other people and it's all just a handshake deal and one person's not happy, well, what are you going to do? Sell That's that right. property? How are you going to buy them out and stuff? So it, it definitely needs to be all written, you know, cut and dry. And this is why Texas requires at least one general partner <laughs> for all the limited. <laughs> I love it. Another topic. Yeah, no, it sounds like another topic. Sounds like we're, we're going to have to put that on the list of future podcasts. So, Trevor, wrap it up for me. To wrap up this topic, what would what what's your future in investing look like, and and what what do you what do you see in the future? I'm gonna I'm gonna continue to buy rental properties and stuff. You know, my my goal is to own at least ten. You know, and then that's kind of my retirement plan. You know, a lot of people talk about retirement plan, and you know looking at can they live off their 401k and stuff if you just looked at having 10 rental properties and stuff and at that point in time you retire their own free and clear or close to free and clear just look at how much you know monthly income that that actually has coming in you know to you especially if they're own free and clear you know average you know rents right now what seventeen eighteen hundred two thousand dollars a month you know times yep. 10 properties you're yep. paying taxes and insurance and stuff on there but um i think most people can live pretty good off you know 10 grand a month in retirement income especially so. if those 10 go by you know one two more a year by themselves so yeah yep there's room yep. for both <laughs> love it and then you add three three four or five vacation properties in the middle of that like you talked about doing and yep. and now you're exponentially growing that so i love that so Trevor, thanks for coming in and sharing your experience and working through this topic with us. I really appreciate it. It's very good information, and I mean, you know, we're here because we are TPM. We are TPM. Who is Trevor Kerr? Um, I'm with uh, Gateway Mortgage. Uh, been in the mortgage uh, industry for 20 years now. Been with Gateway for right at about 10 years. We're a uh, local mortgage company that. We actually own Gateway First Bank as well, a small bank um, out of Oklahoma, which little fact uh, for everyone to know, 
we are the first mortgage company to ever buy a bank. That's never happened before. Hmm. Banks buy mortgage companies. Mortgage companies don't buy banks, but we successfully uh, have pulled that off. And so it's a, it's been a blessing. Gateway has been great to me. Um, great organization. Um, we do all, you know, residential home lending and stuff any loan product out there between conventional fha va usda we are the master servicer of the texas vet program so you veterans that are out there that may have never heard of this program it's an awesome program out there that's just in the state of texas um so any questions, I'll be happy to help you anytime. If you need help or just some advice, you can always give me a call, uh, 972-822-7408, or email me at Trevor, spelled T-R-E-V-E-R dot K-E-R-R at gatewayloan.com. I love it. I love it, too, and that does didn't even know that about about the bank that's interesting because it doesn't take much vetting for a company to purchase a bank does it (laughs) yeah a little bit (laughs) sarcasm sarcasm (laughs) sarcasm alert yeah so 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 trevor you and i have been doing business together i want to say for about 14 years some right in that That right in that range you weren't you weren't with gateway at, at the beginning but you and i have been partners in in real estate, and in my mind, you've been my partner, my lending partner. You've been my preferred lender. Um, when somebody asks me for a preferred lender, you're the only name I give out. Um, and there's a reason for that. It's service, right? Um, I want you to speak to something. Well, first of all, what's something uh, people probably don't realize is, is there's a lot of other grant programs, down payment assistance programs, and so forth. And like you, you are connected with all of them, and even uh Kyle you did uh your your wife was was able to take advantage of a nursing program we didn't even know about Trevor's just in the know on this stuff and talk a little bit about that yeah there's there's a lot of different you know first time home buyer programs out there there's some programs that don't even require you to be a first time home buyer that I help my clients with all the time you know that they come to me and you know, yes, I've already owned a home, so I don't qualify for a first-time home buyer program. Well, in fact, there's some some programs out there that are just purely income based. So if you're making under you know eighty-five thousand dollars a year and stuff, I can assist you with this program that will help you know give you anywhere from two percent to five percent for your down payment, and your closing costs, and. There are sometimes, you know, especially if we're looking at the lower assistance level, they're actually giving you that money and they're actually giving you a better rate than you would get obtain not using Hmm. a program at all. So that's why I end up using these programs a lot for customers because, you know, when I tell them, okay, your interest rate, if you don't use a program, don't do anything is 3% and let's go. They're so happy with it and stuff. Oh, by the way, I can give you this program at 2.75 and give you 2% free money. Right. Well, uh, <laughs> well who, why not? who doesn't want that? <laughs> That's right. I mean, That's right. So, why not? you know, there there's a lot of programs, you know, a lot of lenders, you know, know these programs and stuff as well, you know, but there's a difference, you know, coming to me and I always do what's best for my client and stuff. You know, a lot of them don't want to do these programs because there's a little bit extra work on their part and stuff. So they just going to give you this and not offer this program to you. It's a little bit more work for me, but my customer is so much more happy, you know, getting a lower rate and free money. Yeah. Yeah. And in the crazy market that we're in, um, I think it's worth noting that you know, the type of loan that you have is, you know, disclosed in your offer. But, you know, using those programs and all that is, is more of a back-end thing. That's not gonna It's affect. a back-end deal. It's yeah. not going to affect your offer at all. They don't even know that you're using any special program to get scared of or anything. It, it doesn't affect your offer at all. Exactly. So. I love it. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks for coming in and sharing well, with us. You, you have been a wealth of, of great information. You helped us with our topic. You shared with us your experience, and uh, and we like, couldn't be more more appreciative. Thanks for being our gold mine. Yeah, uh-huh. I guess we only got two pieces out of you from, from John's <laughs> perspective, but I think we got a lot more. 
So. There's probably a lot more gold than two in there. It's just <laughs> this, there's just two little pieces that that I wasn't expecting. That's all. So thanks again. Appreciate you, Kyle. Anything else you want to add to this topic? Um, just uh, we are TPM. We are TPM. Let's get it. <laughs>